supported by the UNCTAD GDP Net Service. The system also encourages the development of electronic trading opportunities, particularly valuable for SMEs that would not otherwise have access to this information. UNCTAD supports the development of SMEs and entrepreneurship in developing countries through its Empretec program. Empretec is particularly strong in South and Central America. It's aimed at training young entrepreneurs and in the countries stricken last year by Hurricane Mitch, together with the five regional governments, Empretec is at work building new business that can hopefully engage one day in international trade in their own right. We are now working to promote the creation of special funds to channel resources from the international financial markets to offer inexpensive credit to small and medium enterprise in developing countries. One innovative effort that UNCTAD has undertaken for SMEs is the planning and organization of the Partners for Development Summit meeting held in November 1998 in Lyon, France. The goal of the summit, which attracted some 2,900 participants from almost 170 countries, including the International Training Center, was to promote the concept of a partnering between organizations in business, education, and government. Many of them were business people from developed in developing countries. As the first United Nations conference of its kind, in which there was no negotiated text or attempt at consensus building, but rather a practical desire to share experiences and find common ground for the construction of partnerships that would further the cause of development and the commercial profit, it was a pioneering endeavor. In all, 18 partnerships were announced at the conference involving non-governmental organizations, companies, banks, academic institutions, regional development organizations, and governments in various combinations. Some of the partnerships are already bearing fruit, such as in the area of road transport, the Biotrade Partnership for the Amazon region, and the agreement in the area of commodity risk management involving the International Federation of Agricultural Producers. All these efforts to promote commercial diplomacy and the positive agenda for trade negotiations take place at a time of a sharp reduction of international trade as a result of the crisis that started in Asia nearly two years ago. In 1997, world trade expanded almost 10% in volume in one of the best performances of the decade. In the following year, however, it had fallen to 3.7 percent. This year, the World Trade Organization predicts that the growth will be about the same, around 4 percent. Another negative trend has been the serious fall in commodity prices, in some cases as high as 30 or 40 percent in the case of copper, coffee, cotton, etc. The main reason for the contraction in trade 
has been the collapse of world demand for imports in Asia, which accounted for more than 50% of import demand growth in the five years between 1990 and 1995. In the face of the slowdown in Latin America this year, the persistence of the crisis in Japan and Russia and the very slow economic growth in Europe, the U.S. economy remains the only major source of import demand in the world, a sort of gigantic black hole sucking world imports. The situation is of course dangerous, not only because of increased dangers of protectionism in the U.S., for example in steel, and the pressure arising from the booming trade deficit, but also on account of the risk of over-dependence of world trade on the U.S. locomotive. What would happen, for instance, if the U.S. has to slow down because of the resurgence of inflationary pressures or a sharp stock exchange correction? Thus, there is no room for complacency about the international economy despite the signs of an incipient recovery in Asia. The worst of the crisis may be over this time, but the integrated nature of today's global markets and the lack of any institutional response to the underlying causes of the crisis means that a repetition could come at any time. The most recent crisis should be called by its true name, a crisis of development, because of the fact that it has largely impacted developing countries particularly and paradoxically, the most advanced and the most promising of them, leaving the industrialized world largely unscathed. Indeed, the continuing boom in the U.S. and the more modest growth in the European Union owes a great deal to the very factors that have decimated the budgets of developing countries, notably record low commodity prices and cheap manufactured imports from countries forced to devalue their currencies. If the hope of development lies in the possibility of growing more rapidly, thus narrowing the gap that separates rich and poor, the fact that in 1998 growth in developed countries was, for the first time in many years, higher than that in the developing world, 2.3% against 1.5%, was a defeat for the entire international community. If I stress this aspect, it's only to show that the international economy and world trade badly need the dynamic stimulation and impulse coming from the developing countries, temporarily interrupted by the crisis. Even the powerful U.S. economy is now beginning to feel the negative impact of the crisis in the slowing down of its exports of manufactured goods to the affected regions of Asia and Latin America. This is why we need a prompt recovery of Japan and a more rapid expansion in Europe as effective means to provide a long-awaited boost
to global demand. Only through this reactivated demand can we expect to see a vigorous return of consumption and imports in the most dynamic regions of the world economy, not to mention the U.S., of course, where consumers continue to demonstrate a strong appetite for imports. I refer to East and Southeast Asia, China, South Asia, particularly India, Latin America, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, France, Egypt, Northern Africa, Japan. The return of a dynamic trade expansion is also important to create a propitious climate for further trade liberalization in the World Trade Organization after the Ministerial Conference in Seattle late in the year. Until now, the WTO has been able to keep the pace of a trade liberalization with a special emphasis on the liberalization of the telecommunications and the financial services. Now the time has finally come to give priority to the sectors of interest of developing countries, making of the next round a true development round. I refer, among others, to the unfinished business of the previous rounds, the sectors where tariff peaks and tariff escalation prevail, according to a recent joint study by UNCTAD and WTO. Those sectors are processed food, agricultural exports, including fruits and vegetables, textiles, clothing, footwear, travel goods, leather goods, rubber articles, furniture. Much remains to be done before we can say that the hard core of a protectionism against developing countries has been removed. In conclusion, let me reaffirm that developing countries will only be able to make progress on all these fronts if they adopt the proactive attitude embedded in the concept of the development as a continuous learning process. As a final example of how nowadays knowledge, technology and know-how have largely replaced or made redundant some old natural advantages, let me tell you something that will probably surprise and even shock some of you. How many among those who watch me today are in fact aware that Germany now accounts for about 9% of the world's total coffee exports, almost half the value of Brazil's export, and Brazil is the largest exporter of coffee. Some will ask, where do the Germans grow coffee? In Berlin? In Frankfurt? In neither of these two cold places? They import raw coffee from different origins. They process it, they blend it, and market the final product with particular efficiency. The same happens with tea, cocoa, and other tropical beverages. In all areas where success in exporting food depends on processing, blending, marketing, the Germans and other industrial countries are doing remarkably well. Tariff escalation equally plays a role. Raw coffee pays zero or four percent tariff depending on the procedure. But final products 
like instant coffee, have to pay as high as 16 or 18 percent. Thus, industrial countries have been able to capture a growing slice of the value added in the production chain. If we want to change this situation, denunciations or tears will lead us nowhere. There is only one way of changing this situation, by learning ourselves how they did it and doing the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Recupero. Let us continue with the second question and answer session. The first call is now from Senac in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Uh, Rubens, would you like to take that call? Yes. Please, go ahead. Senor Recupero. I'm calling from Porto Alegre, Brazil. I would like to know what is your message for us who live in developing countries in Latin America so that we can uh, not be so affected by the financial world crisis? Well, there are a few... And how the commercial alliances, the joint ventures proposed by UNCTAD can really help us? Well, uh, we know. Uh, there are a few elements that are necessary. First, I think all developing countries have to reduce their over-dependence on short-term finance. Not all, because some short-term finance is necessary, for instance, export credit lines. But we should try to attract long-term capital, capital which is greenfield capital that comes to build new plants. Secondly, we have to open new markets in commercial diplomacy, as I explained, and for that purpose, we have to build a coalition for a simple reason. In diplomacy, commercial or otherwise, uh, power counts, and market power counts very much in commercial diplomacy. Our market is not big enough. We have to, to join our market with other markets uh, in order to open markets. But thirdly, as important as opening markets in theory is to take advantage of the tariff reductions that are there. There are many tariff reductions that are not being put to good use because the supply capability of countries is not good enough or, as my friend Professor Krishna has explained, because we have not been able to innovate right. sufficiently. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's go to uh, another call uh, from Mexico City, uh, from Instituto Politecnico Nacional, uh, the Continuing Education Division. Please go ahead. Thank you. A greeting, a warm greeting for all of you from the Polytechnical Institute here in Mexico. We have a question. What was the logistic or the support? What kind of study did you, um, what was the, the reason why Germany became the main exporter of coffee? Thank you very much for your answer. Well, uh, they, they haven't become the main exporter. Brazil and Colombia are still in the lead, but they, they have improved their situation. The main reason is not only related to coffee. It's also to tea and other tropical beverages. When you depend uh, mostly on blending, uh, it is an advantage to be an importer because you can mix uh, raw materials of a several origin. But an important component is know-how, is the capacity of marketing and of creating recognized uh, trademarks. So we have to try to imitate that because we also can import coffee from different countries. Let's have another question from Universidad Tecnológica at Nezahualcoyotl, also Mexico. Please. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity you give me to participate. The question is the following. In a global market, and which has so many changes and so fast, 
How can we reach a balance point in between innovating technology and transferring it, or in the case of the developing countries, how can we develop these technologies? Krishna, would you like to answer uh, that? Okay. Um, as um, uh, Rubin has just said, uh, it's not so much the importance of uh, invention or even innovation, but the main difficulty comes in converting a prototype to a saleable product. That means commercialization. Uh, Germany, for example, had all the capabilities of commercialization which was not in the same scale in, in Brazil. Uh, could we have just one quick last question <laughs> from uh, Lima, Peru? Colegio de Contadores Públicos. You have the question, please. Good morning. Buenos dias. First of all, uh, thank you and greetings and congratulations for this wonderful program and the um, and your presentation, Dr. Recupero. Yeah. Um, yes. My this is the question. Good morning. This question goes for Mr. Recupero. If UNCTAD has already planned to have a programs to strengthen organizations so that the small and medium-sized enterprises in Latin American countries can have access to the m global markets. Yeah. What are your plans? Yes, we, we have this trade point program which is helping small and medium enterprise. We also have the program to train young entrepreneurs. Right. And now we are working on access to cheap credit because this is absolutely decisive. With this, we'll have to close, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you for your excellent questions, but we have run out of time. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Krishnamurti, Mr. Recupero. We hope that you have enjoyed participating in this whole video conference. And thank you to all of you and our associates for enthusiastic assistance. The International Training Center will continue transmitting programs on topics crucial to improving our productivity and global competitiveness in the new millennium. We invite you to participate on July 1, 1999, in the seventh program of our 1999 series entitled The New 24-Hour Society, The Globalization of Time and Work. For additional information on the International Training Center's programs, please consult your participants' manual. If you are interested in participating in training programs which will be offered by the center, please contact the center by letter, phone, fax, or email. On behalf of the International Training Center and all the members of our team here in San Diego, California, I thank you for your participation and interest in today's program.